So I'll continue today with the uh, dynamics of uh, spin glasses, of hard, I mean, cubic spin glasses uh, under, in the transient regime. For a good reason, I don't really know what to say when you are at the longest time scales. And um, explain what, uh, so, th what the link with this Bouchot trap model is really. So let me remind you what I said last, last time. I said, if you take a P spin, so for the pure P spin model on the cube, so I won't reintroduce all the notation, uh, P larger or equal to three, that was important. And the random hopping time dynamics. So I remind you that these dynamics are, in fact, reversible with respect to the Gibbs measure. Their, their long time behavior is ruled by the Gibbs measure. But they are simple. And, and it's highly desirable to get rid of the fact that we are using the random hopping time dynamics because they are not the kind of natural dynamics you would, you, you, would, uh, you would study. They are legitimate because they are reversible, but they are really simple. And uh, as I mentioned, the only recent progress I've seen, the only progress I've seen on trying to get rid of the assumption of these simple dynamics is by Mathieu and Moura. It's still limited, but it's really uh, the first time something has been done in this direction. So that's bad. It would be if you, know, if you want good open problems, do this for real dynamics, even on the REM, that will, even on the simplest model that would already be nice, uh, and pursue what the Mathieu and Moi have done. All right, so we take the pure P spin model on the cube, P larger than three, we take the random hopping time dynamics, and we prove that it looks like a Bouchot trap model. In what sense? We prove then that then, so for this, if you look at the clock, uh, so one more thing, in exponential time scales, that's the important thing. So I have the random hopping time, p larger than three, exponential time scales, which means my time scales are something like exponential gamma n. But so these are very long time scales, but not too long. So the gamma was between strictly positive, so it's an exponential time scale, but smaller than a gamma, which depends on P and on, on the temperature, the inverse temperature, which was explicit. I gave a formula yesterday. So it means that you take long time scale, but not too long. You are not yet at the mixing time. All right? So for this, so we need pure P spin, random hopping time, exponential time scale, three things. Then we prove that the, the clock process of our dynamics, remember the random hopping time dynamics are a time change of the standard random walk on the cube. So you take a standard random walk on the cube and it's just slowed down a little bit like you know, this Bouchot model in 1D where you move along a line and you're s simply slowed down. So the clock process measures essentially the, something like the number of jumps you've made. Right? How, this thing that is this strange clock that is ruling how much you are slowed down along your trajectory. The clock process properly renormalized, and I properly normalized, and I explain last time what the normalization is. Of course, it depends on this constant gamma and on P. Uh, properly normalized. Converges to a stable alpha subordinator. And this alpha is here a function is a function of gamma and, of course, of the inverse temperature. Right. So this says that, in fact, so the, what you see is something like a Bouchot trap model. 
This alpha, what's really important, I explained yesterday, that this alpha is not given a priori. We don't have heavy tail here. There are no heavy tail in this model. But the, um, the, the exponent here is function of the time scale. At a given time scale, gamma gives you the time scale. At a given exponential time scale, you see heavy tails which, whose exponent depends on the time scale. Right? And the longer the time scale, this is the larger the gamma, same test than yesterday, this alpha becomes larger or smaller. When gamma increases, alpha also increases to 1. When gamma reaches this number, alpha becomes 1, where, which is the, where the picture of the subordinator uh, crashes. When gamma goes to 0, this alpha goes to 0. All right, so there are many issues in this statement. First, what is the clock process? And, and I said that yesterday. How do you normalize it? And then what does converge, what, what this convergence mean? And this convergence means first in the topology of CAD-lag processes in the space D for the M1 topology. And I didn't even say what the M1 topology is, but it's a kind of a little weaker topology than the usual scorecard topology. And then uh, there was also the, the question of what about, is that a quench or an anneal convergence? Remember, I have two levels of randomness, the randomness of the environment, which is given by the uh, Hamiltonian, and then the randomness of the walk inside it. So we proved an annealed statement where you take the convergence under you take both randomness. That was the work with uh, Anton and Yirji, Anton Bovier and Yirji Cherny. And we proved something annealed. In fact, we proved something which was quenched with respect to the disorder of the random walk. We have two disorders, the Gibbs measure, the Hamiltonian if you want, and the path of the random walk. So we proved something where you could fix almost surely the path of the random walk and average in the disorder. Then when you had that, you could, of course, average on everything. And then there is this more recent work by Anton, and, and, uh, Véronique, Anton Bovier and Véronique Guérard where they proved something really quenched. So that I checked was 9, this is 12. And so this is, this is the ultimate version. So I said M1 here. Uh, okay, for those who understand, for those who, I mean, if you don't know what the scorecard topology and all that and you don't care, just shut off for five minutes or two minutes. And for the others, let me just explain this. Uh, you know, when you have processes that jump, like, uh, and, and this is supposed to converge to a stable subordinator, which is a process with jumps. What does it mean that a, a process with jump converges? What topology would, would you use, right? For instance, would you, th would you say that this, thing is close to that thing, where you would have two jumps, right? Let's imagine that instead of doing one big jump, I, I do two big you know, half size jumps, essentially at the same time, right? Would you decide that these two things are close? The way you define your topology could decide that they are close or not close. So in the J1 topology, in the usual scorecard topology, then these two things here are not seen as close. And so in the, but in the M1 topology, they are. And that's what you need. Because here it's quite, so what does that strange thing mean? It happens in this model that you, you will have two very large and very close in time successive jumps for the clock process. What does that mean? That means you travel, here's the picture, you travel on the cube, you find a very deep place. So your clock process, as Alex has explained us, stops, right? I mean, or, or rather, which means that this thing jumps, the, the depth of the trap field is large. The time you spend is very large. And then, you move a little bit and you find another very deep trap just nearby or just because you come back, which is low probability to this one. But you know, if you're in a very deep trap in a correlated place like the, 
the, the, the P spin model is, the, the, the neighbors of a very deep trap tend to be very deep too, because things are correlated. So then your next step, so you'll do just one more step and it will still be very deep. So you will have ju big jumps like this. And, but when you, see this, when you look at this from afar, when you renormalize everything, you will see just one big jump. All these little things will be aggregated in one valley in which you spend a very long time. Right? So that's, that's the, the topological question. And this is what Bouvier and Guérard have kind of uh, circumvented very well by looking at some, a, a, a renormalized version of the clock process, a block clock process, which put all, immediately all these jumps together, and then the convergence is in the, in the usual topology. But let's forget that. So, okay, the, this is the end of this topological aside. And from this, you remember, yes? Depends on what? If the environment is indexed by like yes. hypercube or dimension n. So when you say that they prove it's point, in, in what sense and the sample is the Hamiltonian is random, but depends on it. Yeah, but that's uh, okay. No, it, in fact, you could, of course, how is the randomness given for the, for the Hamiltonian? It's the collection of, let's say, the JIJ, the, the JIJ, okay, with the, the, the coupling constant. Just take an infinite large matrix of this and then you, you fix it. All right, so one consequence of that was, of course, the result about aging that I explained uh, yesterday. So in the same context, if you look at the probability, so I think I called that uh, pi, that your dynamics at a time t of n and the time, let's say, uh, so t times t of n and then t plus s times t of n. So, oh, I'm sorry. That this is, that, let me write this, that the overlap between the dynamic at a time t times t of n, or I don't know how I call it, let's say u times t of n and v times t of n. That this overlap is larger than 1 minus epsilon. Okay. So I'm looking at the probability that the, the dynamics at two different instants of time, which are in the same time scale, let's say u smaller than v, that these two things are very close. This is what that means. Oh, by the way, this also, of course, I could translate that in terms of the distance, the Hamming distance between those two things. if you prefer to see Hamming distance, of course, that this would be smaller than uh, epsilon over, maybe n epsilon over 2. All right, so that they are small. And this thing, in fact, converges to, I mean, is, when n is large, to this function that I introduced yesterday, the arc sine law f alpha of, uh, what is it? V divided by U or ah? U divided by V. Okay. And so again, this tells you, even if you don't want to remember what the function is, it means if you take the system at two times, which are you know, u and v in this time scale, then essentially the probability that the two points are, very, are close is a function of u divided by v. All right, so again, the amount of decorrelation of, in the system you have depends on the ratio, so u here will be called the age of the system, and, uh, and that's what what you need here. You, you, you need to measure how, how long you observe the system in units of the age. All right, so that's what we saw yesterday. So how is that, so this explained roughly what, how this works, but how is that related to a Bouchot trap model? So 
Maybe what I should do now is explain the Bouchot trap model in the context which is useful for this. Okay. So, and then this will really connect what uh, Alex was doing here on, on trees or on the line and, and what we're doing here on the cube. So here's what a general version of the Bouchot trap model. So let's imagine that we have a graph, G, fin finite or infinite. So this is a graph. So non-oriented, simple. So this graph is a collection of vertices and edges. V are the vertices and E are the edges. And on this graph, I will define a landscape, if you want, for every x which is a vertex, I have a number tau of x, which, is, which I will call the depth. I will see, think of this as the depth of the trap. Okay. Now, so I've decorated my graph with every point, at every point I have a, a number which I think of as the depth of the trap. And then I look at the standard random walk. Or maybe I should first look at the Bouchot dynamics are simply this. So the Bouchot trap model on this, defined by this collection of things, is simply given like this. It's a continuous time random walk. Continuous time, continuous time Markov chain on, on the vertices and V, where the jump rates are simply C of XY is I could put a constant here, which usually is called nu, divided by tau of x. Okay, so this constant, take one if you want. This constant here, it gives you the unit of time that, that you need to, to do one step. So, but, but of course, it's not very important. So let, for the moment, let me, let me put one. Okay, so this is the jump rate. Extremely simple. If, of course, x, y is an edge, I mean, if the two are uh, neighbors, and it's zero otherwise. So this means you jump along the edges of the, of the graph. But again, since this thing here does not depend on y, it means that once you're at x, so in words, what, what is the model doing? The, this, let's say, x of t waits an exponential time, uh, a time yeah, an exponential time at x with mean tau of x, and then jumps to a neighbor chosen at random. All right, so that's the model. There's a difference here in this model and in the one that Alex explained. In the one that Alex explained, it was directed. We had a drift, in fact, a full drift. So it was the underlying, mo so it would not be like this. It, you know, you would have, you, you wait an exponential time with mean tau of x, and then you move to a specifically given neighbor. Right? You have a one-dimensional structure. In the tree, that was kind of what was happening. You would choose one neighbor and then move along this thing. Uh, whereas uh, here, a priori, this is a different thing because I don't put a drift. Of course, I could put a drift. I could have the underlying random walk could, could have a drift. Here, the underlying random walk does not have this. So again, x of t is a time change of the standard random walk let's say yn, which is the standard random walk, the discrete time standard random walk on the graph. 
Okay, so this is a general thing. For, for, for the moment, it's just, and of course, the time change is easy. It's the clock process, which I already introduced last time. So the question is, so if you want, again, let me re, re, reintroduce this notation. S of k will be the time of the k jump, the k's jump. And so, and so S of k is, of course, simply the sum of these tau of y i, e i, when i is from 0 to, n, to k minus 1. And e i's are i a d exponential with mean 1. This is the time you spend at the site, y, as it's site y i. OK, when you visit it. All right, so that's the uh, clock. And, and of course, I'll define s of t to be s of integer part of t. This will be the clock process. All right, now the question, and, and so of course, x, x of t is y of n when you have had n jumps, which means the time of the nth jump is so that's the time change. All right, so that's a general model. Now, of course, in this model, you have two major ingredients, which change completely the structure, of course. Two major ingredients. One is the graph. Random work on the graph itself, that's a huge theory, you know, a huge part of probability to understand random walks on, ge on general graphs. And second, the time change. So the, the taus, the landscape, right? So these are the two ingredients, ingredients. So one has to, so the two main ingredients here are the one which is the, the potential theory on the graph which means, in some sense, the behavior at infinity of the standard random walk, right? The, how this behaves. And second, of course, is the nature of, of the trapping, that is, the tau. So in the context that Alex was explaining, this thing, the first part, so I want just to classify what we're doing here. The, the, the random walk that he started with on the, on the line, in, in fact, on the half line, was extremely transient. You're going to do more transient than that. It just jump, right? Then when we were on the, uh, on the tree, like he explained this morning, it was also very transient because of the drift. You, you move very fast to infinity, OK? In the spin glass, situation. This is the random walk on the hypercube, which is, of course, extremely recurrent. It's a finite object. It is recurrent, right? So imagining that it, it gives the same result is a little strange, but this can be explained. And then there is the question of the nature of the trapping. So let me explain what is usually done. For all these models, so what, what was those toes here in the case of that Alex explained. First, in the abstract model, there were just numbers chosen randomly. On the, gra on the tree, they were essentially the time spent in those subcritical trees, right? And the time spent were essentially beta to the depth, to the real depth, that he called h, the geometric depth of the trap. So it was exponential of a random variable, right, which was log beta times h. Right? This random variable was complicated because this h was an integer. There are, there are lattice effect, but it was exponential of a random thing. And that's essentially the time you spend in a trap. In the spin glass model, there are essentially the Gibbs weight. So it's essentially exp it's also exponential of a random thing, but the random thing now is the Hamiltonian. Right? So there's a big difference between the two. Because in that one does not capture immediately, usually. But in the 
in the model of, uh, of, the, tr of the tree that we've just seen, this, it's the, the, the time tau is exponential of the depth, and the depth is essentially geometrically distributed. That's what it, uh, Alex was explaining. Think of it like it's not exponential, exponentially distributed, but it's like exponentially distributed. So when you take exponential of an exponential random variable, you get a power law, right? With a fixed index. Do you all see that? I mean, it's trivial computation. Whereas if that's the computation that Alex showed this morning and it was not completely trivial because there was this integer problem. But then, in the case of the spin glass, it's exponential of the Hamiltonian, which is a Gaussian. And that's completely different now. Exponential of a Gaussian is not heavy-tailed. And so the reason why you have heavy tail is the one I explained last time, which is of a different nature. Right? You don't fix the heavy tail a priori. All right, so in general, so what, of course, we will choose the tau of x, which will be chosen to be iid random variable. So in the bushel trap model, we'll choose these guys to be iid random variable, right? And that's, of course, what we essentially had in the, in the, in the tree, as, ex, uh, as Alex explained. It was not exactly true, but kind of true. In the spin glass, as I explained last time, it's not at all true, because this tau of x is exponential of the Hamiltonian, and the Hamiltonian is certainly not IID. It's identically distributed, but certainly not independent. Right? So, and there was the same reason why, in some sense, you could, uh, and of course, that's the heart of, this, of, of the paper with Anton and Yirji, is to show that it behaves as if it were independent. But in the usual, mo in a simple model, they are supposed to be independent. So the first thing, maybe you've wondered, why is it that we assume that there was a heavy tail for these guys? What, you know, of course, if you had the first remark, maybe for the, if, if you had a finite mean for this, right, then, of course, the random walk, look at this. If these guys had a finite mean, this, of course, has a finite mean, this thing by the law of large number would say that S of K would behave like a constant times k. That's the law of large number, right? So your, random, your trap model would be essentially the random walk, time change by something which is essentially linear. So of course, it means that the, then x of t is not very different from from yn, or maybe yn uh, divided by cn or something, right? So essentially, it's the random walk just sped up maybe by, by a factor two. So there's nothing interesting. So the interesting effect that comes when, of course, the, these guys are So the interesting case is when, when the mean of these people are of the taus is infinite, right? And so we assume naturally that they are that they are heavy tail. But why do we assume that? and an alpha here, which has to be between 0 and 1. We assume that just for convenience, because otherwise we don't know how the model works. Because that's a sufficient and necessary condition for this thing to be normalizable and have a limit. That's a basic theorem of large deviation of uh, IID random variable. If you take a sum of IID random variable, for this to, have a, to be normalizable, such that there is a limit in distribution, you need the distribution of these guys to satisfy this. It's a if and only if condition. If it's not like that, then this thing will not have a limit. And this is exactly what 
Alex explained today. So example, uh, what I just said, take tau of x to be exponential of a constant times, I don't know, u of x, where the u of x are iid and say exponentially distributed, mean one. Then of course this is satisfied and you can compute the alpha so then this assumption is okay. Right? Now take tau of x and this is what Alex was explaining this morning, exponential c u of x and take the u of x to be iid but geometric now, say with parameter p, then it's not okay. This assumption is not satisfied. Right. So that's, that was the problem. Because in the example that Alex was giving, this u of x were the depth, and the depths were essentially geometric. So, and just, just check, compute the distribution. That's what Alex explained quickly this morning. Compute this tail, and you will see that it does not satisfy that, because it does, it, it does behave like a 1 over t to the sum alpha, but the numerator is not slowly varying. So that's, so you see it's a kind of, uh, this, it's a kind of delicate situation. You can't simply put anything. But of course what, what Alex referred to this morning is that, and that's also, that, that goes back to the origin of, uh, of probability of uh, IID random variables. You can study sums of IID random variables. The next step is to study arrays of random variables. Right. And the, lim the possible limit, so when you take a sum of IID random variables, the only possible limits in law are the stable distribution, including the Gaussian, of course. And you have an if and only if condition in the distribution, which is given there for convergence. If you t study arrays of random variables where you sum from, say, 1 to k, and, and this, the distribution of this guy changes with k, then all the, the possible limits are much wider, and there are the infinitely divisible distribution of levi kinchin And this is what, uh, what uh, Alex explained this morning, that if you, if you took subsequences, in fact, then you had arrays of distribution, and the limit now can, can exist. Without this uh, condition, it's a much wider thing, and this is what happened this morning. All right, so that's what we will assume. And the question now is, what kind of graphs can we, so that's, that's about the toe. So what about the graph? What do we know? So let me summarize what we know. So first, the first model, in fact, it was introduced, the first example was when G, so that's really the original Bouchot trap model. Original <laughs> was introduced was for G is K sub n, which is the complete graph. Complete graph with n vertices. So that's the simplest model. That's what was initially done. So let me explain how, how this works. So what is the complete graph? You have n points. And everybody is related to everybody. Going to draw all the possible, you know, and etc. at every place. Okay, so from every point you can join, you can jump to every point. And you have now your tau x's here. So here it's clear that in fact the problem for the complete graph, if you look at the clock process, it's essentially purely a problem, a sum of IID random variables. If you accept the following that, you know, what is the difference here? So when you look at the clock process, how could it be that you don't have a sum of IID random variable? It's simply if you visit the same point twice. Right? If I just do a trajectory that doesn't come back to the same point, I have absolutely no correlation between my different terms. So I have a sum of IID random variables, so of course I will have a convergence to a stable subordinator. So the only thing you have to understand here is 
do I, you know, do I revisit the same point? And of course, on a complete graph, when n is very large, if you, if you do that in a fixed time scale, you won't. So, but even in this trivial example, you feel that there are different regimes of time scales, even on the complete graph. Right? There are things that if you wait on the complete graph, if you look at a time scale, so what is usually done is you, you fix the time scale and you let n go to infinity. But you, in fact, have a broad range of time scales. And this is what we discovered in a, I mean, we kind of explained in general in a, in a paper in 05 or 06 with Yerji Churney. And of course, there's a moment where this picture breaks down. You, you know, you, if you are at a, at a, at a moment where essentially, at a, in a time scale at which you are at equilibrium and you revisit the, the same point many times, then maybe something breaks down. And this is, you know, there is a difference here. Even in there, in this place here, the time, the time it takes, when you are before equilibrium and when you are at equilibrium, it's completely different. Initially, on, on fixed time scales, if you want on short time scales, you don't feel that this graph is recurrent. You move along, or, along this thing and you don't feel that it's recurrent. And at a certain point, you begin to feel, feel that if you look at very long time scale, you begin to feel that this graph is finite and because you begin revisiting a lot the same points, which introduces correlation in this thing. How are the correlations introduced in the clock process? It's through the two i's here. If you revisit the same yi many, many times, then you have correlations. And even if the two of, a, of different x's are i8 independent, then if you revisit the same point, you, you feel this. So here, so there, are, there is in fact a range of time scales where you see different things. even in this trivial model. So for short time scales, the clock process should converge to a subordinator and everything is nice. So you can see all this in the, in a paper with Yirji and myself, which was published in CPAM in uh, 05 or 06, I don't know. But then, so, Maybe before going to uh, the thing that is useful for the spin glasses, let me give a second example. So as you can see, this is, in short time scale, this is a very simple thing. You, you do a sum of IID random variables, and this converges to a stable subordinator, as uh, Alex explained. Here's another example. Take now the graph to be Z. Okay, the real line, the, the, the one-dimensional line. Now, and, and take the tau satisfying this. What, what happens here? Does this converge to a bouchot trap model? And this, does the clock process converge to uh, to a stable subordinator? But there is no dri there is no drift here. Right? So it's a one dimensional, but no drift. So for those who don't already know the answer, uh, think for a, a moment, what's the problem here? If you're on Z, the, 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 the underlying random walk, what I call YN, is very recurrent, of course. And you visit each point many, many times, right? So there is a lot of correlation in this clock process a priori. Only the large tau's are important, but you know, you will, uh, you can't simply expect that that, that this sum would be a sum of independent random variables. Right? Because you, you revisit, you, the local time of your random walk plays a big role. And in fact, the limit is not at all. Here is not a stable subordinator. So when you look at the random walk, at the, the bouchot trap model in this thing, properly normalized, and I won't say con converge to something which is uh, 
to a very singular process, which is called the Fontes isopi Newman diffusion. So in 1D, the Bouchot picture breaks down. Right? The limit is you don't have this independence. And in fact, you have a very strong correlation between the path of the underlying random walk and the clock. Right? Because depending on where the random walk has been and what kind of deep traps it has found, then this will affect the time change. So this is a completely different word. So you see that's, uh, and of course, these are the two extremes in some sense. Uh, here you have the complete graph, and here you have z, very, very different things. Of course, you could ask, what about zd? So now take d larger than 3. You may think, OK, now this is, I look at the Bouchot trap model on zd. So that was also studied in physics after the introduction by Bouchot of, uh, of the model on the concrete graph, Bouchot and Dean. It's on ZD, then the random walk will be transient. You, have a, you don't have it like the picture that uh, Alex explained, which was you know, essentially you, you move away on a ray. It's not what happens on ZD. Right? But it's still transient. So you still, even if you revisit points, you won't revisit them very many times. Right? So you get out of it. So the picture, here there is a chance that the Bouchot picture is correct. Not for reason as simple as the one that Alex explained, that you move essentially along one direction. But at least there is a chance. And the answer is yes. So the, the Bouchot picture is correct. And in this case, so the clock process converges to, converges to a stable subordinator. And you have aging as before with the same function, with the same arc sine low. So you see that it's very universal. And in fact, you have something more. You have the whole process properly normalized converges to something converges to something which is called the fractional kinetics process, which I can explain in a, in, in a few words. The spatial motion of your random walk, is, of course, converges to a Brownian motion, if you forget the time. But then this whole thing is a Brownian motion, time change by this clock process, which is a stable subordinator, so, or the inverse of a stable subordinator. And the fractional kinetic process is just that. You take Brownian motion, you take an independent alpha stable subordinator, and you take the Brownian motion time change by the inverse of the alpha stable subordinator. That's the, the FK alpha process. So this is really the Bouchot picture. This is kind of added, but you know, this is what we've seen here. Okay. So this is true in dimension larger than three. In fact, now the question is what happens in dimension two? And dimension two now is recurrent. So, you know, it could fall on this side or on that side. In fact, it falls on that side. So this is, this is work with uh, Yerji. So this, this was work, of course, by Fontes, Isopi, and Newman. This is work with Yerji Cherney and myself and, uh, and Mountford. All right, so... In finite dimension, we understand what happens. In, in this context, we cannot really say what, what Alex was saying this morning. It's essentially one dimension. But we, we still have the same thing. You find this Bouchot thing because when you travel on ZD, let's say D larger than 3 to see it easier, your trajectory, you take, if you take a large box, your trajectory, before it exits this large box, will, will not find the deepest traps in this box. Right? Because the deepest traps are very rare, 
and usually they, they, it won't find it because you're transient, you just get out. So what's important are the deepest traps you find along the trajectory. And these are the deep traps. And then the philosophy is the same as the one that Alex explained. You have the shallow traps, which of course you see plenty of, and the time you spend in them does not count. Then you have the very deep trap that, are, that would count very much if you found them, but you just happen not to find them. That's where the potential theory of the walk is important. You don't hit those points. And then you have the deep traps, which are in fact the deepest trap that you find. And these dominate completely the clock process and gives you the alpha stable subordinator. But even in this very simple case, you have this multi-range of time scales. If you do simply the following now, if instead of taking ZD, an infinite volume and a fixed time, now if you take a large box in ZD, right? say a torus, you make it periodic, or you reflect at the boundary, it's the same thing. You take a large box of size L, right? Now you have plenty of time scale, and, and you look at the random walk on this. Now it's a finite graph. So in the very end, it will be recurrent. What I'm saying now about you move out and you don't see, this won't happen. You will feel some correlation in the, in, the, in, the, in the clock process, obviously. So now you have a range of time scales. For short enough time scale, which depend on the size of the box, all that can be quantified, and you have this in this paper with Yirji. For short enough time scales, it's as if you were an infinite volume. Right? You haven't seen yet that you are in a fixed box. So then you have the Bouchot picture. But in this short enough time scale, then you know, uh, there is a range. And then at some point, you begin to feel that you feel the box. And, and if you go to long enough time scale, then you are completely at equilibrium in this box. You will have had time, you, you are even beyond the cover time of the box, which means that you will have time to find every one of the deepest trap, every hay in the stack, I mean, every uh, needle in this haystack, which means the deepest, deepest point, which is well hidden in the middle of the box, you will find it. And this will, of course, dominate. All right, so even in this thing, there is a, 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 a question of time, a range of time scales, right, which is, which is important. Okay, so that's the kind of models that, uh, that we have. And of course, now we have the hypercube, which is what we are studying now, right? So on the hypercube, you need to understand the, so what we are saying here is, let's imagine now that I'm doing something very simple. I took my, on the hypercube, I look at this tau of x to be exponential beta u of x, where the u of x are uh, exponential, iid exponential with mean one and with the square root of n. Or even here, I'm sorry, no, let's forget the square though. Like that. that's, that's a very simple model. That's, of course, if you choose this beta properly, this has heavy tails. This is a, a heavy tail distribution, right? Probability that tau of x is larger than t is just the probability that beta u of x is larger than log t. And this u of x being exponential, this is exponential minus log t, one over beta, so which is one over t to the alpha, with alpha equals one over beta, if I'm not mistaken. All right, so it's, it's a power law. So for this model now, I have the random walk. And the question is, so first, how is that related to our model of spin glasses? Right. So, this is related directly to the model of the REM, right? To the random energy model. In the random energy model, our tau's are in fact exponential beta square root of n h of x, where this h n of x, of course, x was used to be called sigma, are i a d n zero one. So, how are these two things related? Again, this is Gaussian, this is IID, uh, this is exponential. But remember, now do the following. Replace, look at the extreme values of the HNs. 
I'll just look at the extreme value of the extra, extra, extra. So you remember that there are, in this thing, there are in the scale, the extreme values of, Ga of Gaussian are in the scale square root of log of the number. So since here I have 2 to the n, this is, I remind you, of in the order square root of n. Order square root of n. Right? So just kill, so in this model, kill, the, replace every hn, which is smaller than, say, epsilon square root of n, so we, which is not in the scale of the largest one, by zero. Do that. Right? So what does that mean? You say if a trap here is an hn is too small, then I decide that this trap is very shallow, and I just forget it. I just replace the tau by one. I, I spend time one. I don't, I don't wait there. So I've changed completely, I, I, and, and then I just and then keep the others, but now for, about the others, but for the extreme value are essentially are like exponentials. That's what I explained. So once you normalize them properly, these are like exponentials. Right? So you keep the large ones, and you know it's a Poisson point process. I explained that, that the last time. And so you, re you keep the deep and you replace them by you know, just something exponential. And, and for the rest, you just kill them. All right? And then you get, the, you get this model. So this is, a very, this is a very simplified model of the REM. Because what you've simplified here is the following. You keep your, on the, your cube, you have the very deep traps. You keep the, those deep traps. And the rest, the, there is a lot of disorder in the rest. You just forget it. You flatten completely your landscape. Right? And in particular, of course, near, uh, replace this epsilon by epsilon over 2. You know, it doesn't change much. So, in fact, the landscape outside of the deep trap is itself made of lots of traps. And it's very rough. So doing this, doing this is, of course, a, a very hard simplification. So when I say that it's related to the REM in certain time scale, there is this very, very serious simplification that I'm doing here. Okay? But still, let's study this. Then, so the question is now like this. You have the cube. This is the cube. And in this place, you have some of the large values of this, I mean, of this hue, right, or, or this tau. So these are the deep traps. And I have a finite number of them, essentially, like Alex explained. And now I have my random walk that walks in the cube. And the question is, when do I visit these guys? Right, so I have to, the question is now, if I start from a point here, which I choose at random in the cube, I have two questions. How much time, so I have this cloud of deep traps, which means that the, let me call it, I don't know, x. So that's the set of little x's where these taus are very large. Obviously this, you know, these are IID points, so it looks like a Poisson cloud. And the question is, when I take a random walk, so the question is, first, how much time to reach x for the random walk, for the standard random walk, yn? All right, so I have this random walk. How much time does it take to get to that point? And second, so I need the, an estimate of the time and maybe a distribution of this time. And second, what, so that, that's the hitting time of the cloud. And now it is, what, what I need is what is the hitting distribution? Of this cloud. Right? That is, when I start from a point at random, 
how do I enter this, this thing? Right? Do, I, do I choose one? I mean, is this, what kind of distribution do I get? So the answer to this, and what I'm saying here is really rough, but is if this cloud is not too uh, heavy, so it couldn't go, it could be exponentially large, but you know, not to the order two to the n, to the, to the constant time n, then essentially this time, uh, here the time to, to, to reach that it can be computed, and essentially the, the time is, ex is exponentially distributed. So why? Let's imagine that this cloud is just one point. So this is very well studied. This has been studied by, uh, by Matthews a long time ago. So we had to really work hard to, do, to, to, to extend this, but for one point it's not too hard. So the question now is very simple. You take the random walk and you ask how much time to reach one specific point. Right? This time, this is, very exp this is exponential. So why is it exponential? You know, the exponential distribution is the signature of only one phenomenon. It's always the same. Right? The exponential distribution is essentially always you, 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 you try to succeed in, you know, by repeating an event, by repeating an, a trial where you have a very small probability to succeed. Then the time it takes to succeed is exponential. That's, nothing is exponential without this kind of interpretation. So why is that? Why, so here it's like you start from your point, you try to reach this given point, and this should be difficult. It is difficult, of course, to find one given point. But why? There is no drift against you here. The drift is entropic. Right? That this space is huge. Finding one point in a huge space, you have to fight entropy. Right? Entropy, in fact, really plays the role of, 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 a, of a drift here against finding this point. So finding this needle in a haystack is really hard. So every time you try, you have a, very, a tiny probability to succeed. So essentially, you, you, you kind of come close and you, and you fail. Even if you fail by just two or three spins that are not aligned like you want, too bad. You fall back to being completely to, to back in the bulk. And then you try again and, and again and again. And so when you have this very long, large number of trials, in the end, you have something which is exponential. So this is easy with no one, one point. When you have a, a denser cloud, it's still kind of true. This is what happens here. And the hitting distribution here, if your cloud is sufficiently sparse, it is uniform. Okay? So that's the point. You, you, these points are sufficiently hard to find that once one, when, when your quest to find one succeeds, you have the same probability to succeed with this one or with that one. Okay? So all this is described in a, a, in a paper with a long paper which has been published in the, so the potential theory of, on the hypercube. It's a long paper with Veronique Gerard and myself, which, is, which has been published in an electronic journal. Electronic journal of probability because it's 120 pages long of potential theory, but you can make that very precise. Okay, so then once you know this, you understand how the model works here. So you travel around, you find a deep point. Essentially, uh, it's uh, chosen randomly among those deep points, and then you get out of it and you move again. But now you have to fit something. How do you know what level should be decided as being deep? It's simple. It should be such that the time that you spend in the trap is essentially of the same order of magnitude as the time you take to, to find it. Right? So the time to find it is very long because of this entropic effect. Finding a few points in a cube are, is hard. And you can measure how, how long it is. And then, so if you take your, your, your depths, I mean, your trap too deep, then you know, that, that won't work because it will be too hard to find them. The time to find them will be too long. If you, find, if you take them too shallow, you will find them in too short a time. So there is just, you know, the right scale where the time you, to, to find them and the time you spend in them is of the same order, right? Then the, uh, but still, uh, the, 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 
in the end, when you get to the limit, the time to find them becomes zero. You, you, you know, there are, it's slightly less. You, you just zoom through, through, through the other ones. So once you have this, you see where the, uh, the stable subordinator is. And it's not a one-dimensional structure that, like we had before. What you do is you add the, the, this random time, this, this clock process is just adding this random time at these points that you've chosen along your, uh, you know, in your visits of these X's. Okay? So that's, that's where the stable subordinator is. And how is that related to the complete graph? Why would Bouchot start with the complete graph? Bouchot thought of the following. You had the REM model, which is even more complex than that. You look on the cube, you look at the very deep traps, and these deep traps are like a complete graph. You, if you extract them, they are like a complete graph. You can go, move, move from anyone to anyone with the same probability, because of what I just said. And so you forget the large graph, which is the cube, you just keep those few things, and you decide that you move among them with equal probability, and in the right time scale, and this would be the model on the complete graph. And Bouchot was right. Okay. That's, that's the, uh, the idea. So for the REM, this picture can be made exact. That is, the limit is a clock process, etc. on the whole range of time scales, including up to the very last moment before the mixing time. That's what we started, in fact, in our work with Anton and Veronique a long time ago on the REM, and those very, very long time scales. And then we understood we had this for all sorts of time scales. So for the REM, you have this thing for all time scales until equilibration. Of course, at equilibration, it's a little different. For the P-spin, as we've seen, we, we have that only to a certain time scale where we expect, of course, something else to happen after, after that, which is the transition to one RSB. All right, so now I want to talk about what's happening in the... Uh, or maybe it's a good time to, to make a break. But I want to talk, what, what's happening, even in this picture, what's happening if you take shorter time scales? So let me just say that. Imagine you take time scales that are too short in order to find really, uh, you know, here you need a time scale in which when you move around, you find one, you get out of it, and you have time to find another one of the same depth. And then another one, and then another one, so that you have many jumps in this, in this uh, stable subordinator. But now imagine that, you know, in your time scale, you, you find one which is deep, and then, then you don't have time to find another one. Right? So this, this would be in a shorter time scale, then the limit cannot be a stable subordinator. It will be something, something else will happen. And this is what we call extremely aging, and we will, what we will, uh, I will explain after that for our model of P-spin. Um, so you see here we have this strange thing. Everything else we have convergence to Bouchot type of things when you do it properly. Maybe different type of range of time scales, all sorts of things. And there is maybe the, what, what Alex explained this morning where it, it's a little twist because we didn't really have a stable thing in the end, but, but it's something of the same nature. We had an infinitely divisible distribution. There is one thing standing out, which is this. In Z, Bouchot, forget it. It's not Bouchot. It's, this is too recurrent. It's not Bouchot. Right? So here is a question. What, and, and now I'm making a publicity for Manuel's talk on Thursday. Okay, so this is the work of, joint work with uh, Manuel Uh, Yirji, Roman Reufman, and myself, and then there is another paper with, which is just Manuel and myself. So ma imagine now that we, we take again the question of a, of a random walk on a, on a Galton-Watson tree, but now we take a critical Galton-Watson tree. Right? So critical means that the that the mean number of offspring taking the notations of, of uh, Alex is one. Right? Necessarily, you have leaves, 
and the mean, except, except the trivial case. So you have a critical tree. So a critical tree always dies, right? get extinct. So you condition, so you, you, you take what is called the incipient critical tree, which means the following. It's a way to be sure that this tree is infinite. So what you do is you take a critical tree, you condition it to reach level n, to have n generation, to survive for n generation. The probability to survive for n generation, of course, goes to zero. You condition by this small event, small probability event. And then you let this, this n go to infinity. You get, a, in the limit, a model which is called the incipient tree. Okay, so that's the only way to have an a critical tree, which is infinite. So, What's the difference between a critical tree locally and, and a supercritical tree like Alex was describing? In a supercritical tree, it's locally hyperbolic. Locally, the volume is increasing exponentially. I mean, not, not locally, globally. This tree becomes big when, it's, when it doesn't die. So when you're at the point, you are really easily pushed to, to the leaves. You know, that's uh, by itself. Uh, the critical tree, you know, it's much, uh, the critical tree is much thinner. So the supercritical tree, when you saw the Harris decomposition that Alex was giving this morning, you have this backbone, which increases exponentially fast, which is big. And you have the parking lots, if you want, the, the high, that's the highway, and you have the parking lot, the traps, which are very small because they were su subcritical trees. Right. In, a, in this incipient tree, you should, the same picture is completely different now. You have the backbone, which is also something going to infinity, but the backbone is in fact here, is one dimensional. So the backbone is just one path. There is only one path that goes to infinity. So if you start from your root, then there is only one you have, because you've conditioned this to not die, you have only one path that goes to, uh, to carries your family name ad eternam, for infinity. Right? And then you have, as before, so I want to use the same red thing, you have, you know, trees attached to this, which are dangling of this. But these now are critical trees. So before we had a very large backbone, which was super critical, and tiny traps. Here you ha we have a very small backbone, which is 1D, and very large traps. Okay. But now I, I'm not putting a bias. No bias. I just take the standard random walk on this. So why? Why do we have trapping here? So look, this is like Z. So this looks like the model over there. You have Z here. And when you look at the motion just along the backbone, it's a motion along the Z. And it's trapped, because as soon as you get into this thing, you have to uh, and come back. So the trapping time will simply be the time you spend in each of these traps. All right. So why do you spend a lot of time in those traps? In the example that Alex was treating this morning, the traps were small, so it was not geometric, really. The traps were small, but you were pushed very hard in it, in them, so it was really hard to get out. And that made you spend a lot of time in those traps. Here, you're not pushed in them. You just fall in them, wander in them, but they are big, so you can spend a lot of time in them. All right? So this looks like a trap model on Z. Right? It is really a trap model on Z. You move on Z, and you spend time, and random times. Here you have random depth, if you want, which are the time you spend in those traps. So it's, in, in this case, it's kind of easy to understand what the mean time is. The mean time you spend here is, as before, related to the depths of this. And, but, and the depths of the critical tree we know what it is. Right? It's well understood. So in some sense, we know enough of the geometry 
of those traps to understand the, the time you spend in them. So we have typically a model that looks like the Bouchot trap model on Z, right? And so should the answer of, to this be the Fontes is op Newman diffusion, like here? So if you look at the motion along the backbone, properly normalized, should that converge to the Fontes is op Newman diffusion? Or should that converge to the fractional kinetics model, to the Bouchot type of things? What could make this look like Bouchot, even, right, and, uh, rather than, thi than this? There is a difference here with the, the simple model over there. In the simple model over there, once you have a, a trap here, it has, you, know, you have a large tau, you spend a large time. Here there is something else. When you move here and you get into this trap, you may very well not feel the fact that it's very deep. Right? So you just could come, there is, no there is no bias to push you. So you could come in, do a little tour here, and then come back. And then move on. So you could encounter a terribly dangerous trap for you, but you're lucky, you just get in and out. So this randomization of the fact that you don't feel the real depth suddenly makes the, the, the tail of the depths irrelevant in some sense, I mean, less relevant. The real question is, do you feel the depth or don't you feel the depth of the real trap? Do you get to the bottom of it or not? And you have a small probability to get to the bottom of it and feel the depth. Right? So then if you don't feel the depth, if you randomize, then you could very well have a Bouchot model. So the time, this clock process could be a subordinator. So what is it? What's the, is it Finn or is it Bouchot? And the answer will be given by Manuel tomorrow. And of course, the answer is none of the above. It's a new thing, which is very exciting and very interesting that Manuel will explain. All right, so let's go back now to extremal aging. Spin glasses. Oh, by the way, related to extremal aging into this. Now, if you take the same model and you put a bias in it, now you push. All right. So what will you get here? So this has been studied by uh, Alex, David Croydon, and uh, Takashi Kumagai. What you will see if you do that will be extremal aging the kind of thing that I'm going to describe now for spin glasses, okay? So, which means, in, in a word, you find one deep trap, you get stuck in it, and you forget the rest. Of course, in a more quantitative way than that, but this is what happens. All right, so let's go for extreme aging. So now I take, again, pure P-spin models, but now P larger than 2, so this includes Sherrington Kirkpatrick. I take, again, the random hopping time dynamics, but now, instead of taking exponential time scales, I will take sub-exponential time scales. So let me take a gamma n here. And this gamma n will go to 0. So my time scale is exponential little o of n. Okay, So it's shorter. In fact, I will always take this gamma n to be n to the power minus c. So you take time scales which are like n to the power 1 minus c. Okay, and C is between zero and a half here, for obvious reasons. So larger than zero, so that it's really sub-exponential, and it's more than a half for reasons that are uh, obvious here. But I, I won't get there. So you take time scales which are smaller, shorter, because in fact, if you take a C larger than a half, then the time scale is so short that you essentially do only a, a finite number of, of, of jumps. So it's not very interesting. So. But I'm now going to say that the behavior in those time scales is completely universal. So in those shorter time scales, as I explained, the behavior is universal. And comes under the name of extremal aging. We, I mean, introduced this uh, 
word of extreme aging with so this is done this is this was in this work with Honor Gun and myself. So in order to explain what it is, maybe the first one statement I could explain is let's try to look again at aging. So we were looking at the probability that my configuration at time, say t of n, and this time scale, a long time scale. Uh, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting that. The overlap here, or the distance as we had before, the Hamming distance between this and maybe a time, uh, let's say, what we had before was a u here and a v here. And we looked at the probability that this distance is smaller than epsilon over two times n. The two, the two things are close. And remember, we had before that this was like a function f alpha of u over v. That's, that was before. That's not true now. That was the aging result. Formally, what was alpha here? Alpha was gamma over beta square. So here, when gamma goes to 0, this alpha should be 0. And so this should be f0, if you want. But this doesn't mean anything. Right? So you can't expect this. So the result that we, we have now, so this meant that in order to significantly move where, from where you are after a time u times t of n, you needed to, to wait a time that was also proportional to t of n. Here what happens is at a time that is proportional to t of n, nothing happens. Right? You have to go at, at a larger distance. So let me uh, give you the right scaling of all this. Okay, so I will take here a time t1 of n and a time t2 of n. So this t1 of n will be uh, my exponential gamma n times n. And my t2 of n will be, so let me write this, 1 plus t ta times uh, t1 of n but here to the power 1 over alpha n, 1 over gamma n. Okay, so let's, let's look at those two time scales. The window I'm looking at is, okay, I have this uh, long but not too long time scale, the sub-exponential time scale. And then here I look at the same time, but now multiplied by this, which when, since gamma goes to 0, this thing goes to infinity, this is very, very large. This is diverging. And now I, I'm saying that this, this thing converges to a function of theta, of, the, uh, of this uh, time scale, which is simple, simply 1 over 1 plus theta times to the power 1 over beta squared, where beta is the inverse temperature. OK, so that is, um, and this result that we have here is annealed, right? We have it. This is annealed, so this is proved in an annealed way with uh, and in a quench way in this more recent work of, of Veronique, Anton, and somebody else. So let's look at what this means. Right? It means if you wait such a time scale, you found a deep trap in deep in the sense of what you can find by that time scale. And essentially, the time it takes to get out of it Right? So that the distance uh, is, uh, is not too small, then the time to get, time to get out of it is, uh, is like that. Right? Which means, oh, I, I must have meant larger. Than, yeah. You go a certain distance. The overlap is more than 1 minus epsilon, and the distance is larger than this. And so the time it takes to essentially move away from the deep trap you found, this time diverges with it in this time scale. So if you stay in the time scale exponential gamma n, you never get out of it. You need to go much further away. Right? And then this time is this probability is like that. All right? So that's that's what the, the story says. And so how is that related to the clock process and all that? So 
So this is obtained through a theorem of about the following. You look at the maximum Gibbs weight or, or you know, maximum uh, of the, the Gibbs of the exponential beta h and p of x along the trajectory of the random walk. Right, when you, so you move your, your trajectory or of my sigma n of t when t is smaller than my t1 of n. So you look at this maximum of the, the, the deepest trap you find, right? And second, you look, of course, you want to look at the sum of all the trap of these along the, along the trajectory. You have your trajectory, you look at the maximum thing and the sum. The sum, of course, is essentially the clock process. And what happens in the regime in which we are is that the sum and the maximum are the same. They're essentially scaling the same order. That's what I was, so maximum is here essentially roughly the same as the sum. So this is not stated very precisely, but that's what it is. So what does that mean? That means in this trajectory, which is short, I mean, kind of long, of course, it could be exponential n to the 3 fourth, but it's still too short so that if you look at the deepest thing you found, the time you spend, if you want, in the deepest thing, or the time you spend in total is really the same. Okay? So, and this can be written more precisely. So let me give you the theorem uh, of... Uh, I need one scale which I keep forgetting, so that's why I need this, so here it is. R of n is by definition the following number, one over gamma n, beta, okay, I have a square root of two pi n, which is not crucial, exponential gamma n square, beta square, uh, over beta square, and then two and n. All right, so that's the time scale. So think of gamma n as being uh, n to the, I don't know, one fourth. This is n to the one half. And then, then what we have here is, uh, so if I look at this maximum, we call it mn, t r of n, in this, in this thing, normalized by t of n, T of n is T1 of n, if you want. This converges in distribution to a certain process, which depends on beta. And the maximum, the sum, of the same thing, normalized in the same way, converges to the same thing. But here you need to take the power of this of gamma n. So this is the basic theorem. So, you know, I was telling you, if you take a sum, if you take iid random variables, because let's go back to the idea that, so that's really the theorem. So first, you see that the two things are just doing of the, the, the same thing, except for this power gamma n. So the, yes, yeah, so I should not say that. The max is like the sum to the, uh, the sum to the gamma n is like the max. So this sum is, a, you could see it as a sum of IID things. 
but it would be a sum of IID random variables which are in the dom which for which the alpha corresponds to zero. They have tail which are heavier than any polynomial. And in this case, there is no way, as I said, to take a sum and normalize it in such a way that it converges to something. So, you know, if your tail is like one over log u, there is no way you can normalize the sum to converge to something. But you can normalize it non-linearly. This is what you do here. You take this sum, normalize, but you take this power here. Then this converges to something. Okay? And this something is the same as the limit of the maximum, properly normalized. So for IID random variable, this is very simple. Uh, this is a little harder, but not too hard. And so the, uh, the real question is, what is this? So this is called the extremal process. I don't want to explain too much of that. And uh, so, so you see here we, we are even beyond Bouchot, because Bouchot never studied the, the case where alpha equals zero. But, but this would be the natural extension of Bouchot for alpha equals zero. If you take a Bouchot model in the situation where the tails are, correspond to alpha equals zero, where you have uh, you know, heavier tail than any polynomial, you would get that very simply. All right, so that's it. The f Bouchot model is still correct here except we've extended its range of validity. So the view, in order to prove that, is the same as before. So for the REM, let's start with the REM. So I will just explain with words. Let's start with the REM. With the REM, you have, you do the same as before. You just truncate. You just don't care about the, the, the depth, which are uh, 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 you know, not extreme. So you keep only uh, the largest one. Then essentially, you have this motion along deep traps. And the question is, as before, how much time does it take to reach one? And, and, uh, but there, you are in a regime in which, in those shorter time scale, you are in a regime, in fact, where you don't have time to go to two of them. Right? That's, that's really the, the thing. So you still have to show that, essentially, along your trajectory, your piece of trajectory, which is here, you have, so you look at those ma this maximum, and you see that the maximum and the, is essentially a you, you see that because you prove that you have a, an IID structure on, the, on, on this thing. Right? And again, it's because the points where you visit those deep traps, those that are close to the maximum, are in fact very far, away, far apart on the trajectory. Right? So for the REM, you can get this picture very, very completely. But for the, uh, and it's not too hard. For the P-spin, it's a little harder because you have to Again, the question is, locally, your things are definitely not uh, non-correlated. So you again have to use some kind of block, block uh, renormalization argument. But what we do with, uh, with owner here is very inspired by what we had done before with Yerji and, and Anton, uh, Yerji Chani and Anton Bovier on, on, the, on the exponential time dynamics. The, the, the coarse graining is a little different. You have to go a little deeper, but it's, but it's uh, very inspired by this thing. And uh, maybe I don't want to get too much into that. The, uh, yeah, maybe, yeah, let's say that. What has not been done here, of course, but I, I believe is completely should not be a, a serious problem, is if you take, you know, in all these things that I've explained here, we've done uh, for sub-exponential and for exponential dynamics, we've done only the pure p-spin models. Doing it for a mixed p-spin model should be doable, um, except, of course, that you remember that the, the um, in the exponential time scales, the gamma was limited above by something which depended on p. So when you begin to mix all these things, you will have to be careful there. Knowing at what time this breaks is not clear at all. Uh, and um, and in, for the sub-exponential case, 
I think the, the extending this to mixed piece spins is, should be simple because this is valid on the, on the whole range here. One more thing to be said, which is a bit crazy, that we, we ha there is a technical difficulty for p equal 3 in what we do. And I honestly have no clue why. It's just there. It's not very, uh, probably not very significant, but it's, but it's there. All right. And um, now what I want to, okay, so I, I will stop with it. I, I, I could go on on this, but so what I explained last time is that I also believe that there is an extremely aging result for which is accessible for dynamics. So, you, you know, again, this is the first result that you have with P equal 2, which contains SK. I think such a result is also accessible for dynamics on which we usually we can't say anything reasonable, like dynamics of the uh, short range spin, some short range spin glasses. In those time scales, this phenomenon, this exact result should be the same. Right? And I think that is accessible. It doesn't mean easy, but that is accessible. Understanding the dynamics of, say, the Edwards Anderson model in, in exponential time scale is much, much harder. And, and, and we should not fall in this regime. So I'm saying that for the Edwards Anderson model, so the short range spin glasses, for the following reason is for this is based on how did we get to this with honor? It's because we realized that the REM universality, the static REM universality result that I gave you two lectures ago, were valid when you look at an energy level which was little o of n for any p. So maybe there was a dynamic result that would also be valid for sub-exponential time scales, exponential of little o of n, for any p. And this is what this does. But now, if you look at, there, are regi there, there is a REM universality which also encompasses the uh, edwards anderson model when you take short, I mean, uh, uh, short time scales, I mean, lower level, I mean, higher level of energy. And, and so this should be translated in, a, in a, a time, I mean, a dynamics universality too. I believe, you know, there is no obstruction. So it, should, it doesn't mean it's easy, but there is no obstruction. For a time scale that would be larger, of course, there is obstruction because you know that for the Edwards Anderson, you don't have static universality, REM universality, so it's not even worth trying it. All right. Before, so next time I will talk about the, um, the uh, spherical dynamics and you know, Kuglion de la dynamics and this kind of thing. And this will wrap this up. But before going there, I want to explain, I wanted to be fast on this so that I've because I would like to explain one thing which I believe is int interesting as, as, as a lead to future research. The, you know, everything we've been doing here, the sub-exponential time scale or the exponential time scale for p larger than three, proceed along the following line. You have, which, you have the REM model somewhere in your mind, which is simple. Then you can simplify the REM model in, with parameter n. You can simplify it to the kind of si very simple model that, you know, on the complete graph, that's the Bouchot trap model. And I explain how, right, you, you choose. So this kind of, so some people call this REM-like model. And I believe this is really not a good notation because proving that the REM model is like the REM-like is enormously difficult. So when you do that, you cheat seriously, intellectually, because you're saying something which is trivial, right? It's as if you take any hard model of physics in which you can prove a, a central limit theorem, and you call this hard model the Gaussian model. The Ga you know, uh, difficult, right? There's something wrong there. So, but anyways, this is a simple model. And, and then we have the p-spin model somewhere, which, is, which are harder. And we, what we say that there is a link here, this was the REM universality, at certain level of energies, right? At certain energy level. So this was translated to dynamic universality at certain time scales. And remember, that what we had in the proof is for every time scale, 
exponential gamma n, corresponded a certain energy level. So at a certain time scale, what we saw really is that we were sampling an energy, we were sampling some form of microcanonical ensemble, a fixed energy, and which corresponded, as the physicists would say, to some kind of effective temperature. Right? Because that's the equivalence of ensembles. You have a microcanonical ensemble, which corresponds to a canonical ensemble at a certain temperature. So when you move the time scale, you move the level of your, your microcanonical ensemble, and so you move the effective temperature. Good. So we had to prove something like this. And from this, we got the limit. We proved that everything behaved like in the REM, which itself was like everything behaves like in the complete graph, which was the Bouchot model. And we had this stable subordinator and all that. And this was hard. In fact, studying the REM itself, the dynamics of the REM took quite some time. This is a trivial model, but this took quite some time. And then this reduction also took quite some time. Here is it possible. But what, ha what was happening in the proof was what in the end? In the end was we are vi seeing traps which are at a certain level, which, as I said, correspond to a certain effective temperature. And what we did, we had to restrict our energy level or our time scale in such a way that we are still in the regime where we have no breaking, of, no symmetry breaking at that effective temperature. We have essentially, uh, and, and how was that trans? How was that seen in the proof, deep in the proof? It was seen in the way when I was saying, uh, I see a very deep trap somewhere in the trajectory, I see another one, and they are far enough that their overlap is zero. That's where I was using something, which is what? I could have gotten to this. It, so this we proved kind of very, very hands-on. And of course, that's the origin of all the results I have here. The basis of the result is, Essentially, I visit traps. The important traps for the, for the clock, model, pro, clock process are all at the same depth, kind of, same order of magnitude, and they are far away. And then there is all this question as how do I travel from one to the next and all that, but let's forget it. They are at overlap zero. But now I could have imagined something else, which is trying to tie that to the Parisi picture. And of course, it breaks because we're, I'm still here. We are able to deal only with the trivial thing, which is where you have replica symmetry. But imagine that I could have a proof which goes like this. Because if you want to progress and goes in, in, in time region, in time domains where things are not trivial, like in the REM, I believe that doing things like the way we've done them is not feasible. I mean, it, it becomes heavier and heavier and harder and harder. Except, you know, Maybe I'm getting older and older, but you know, you need a lot of energy and courage to go on. But maybe it's time to shift to something a little more smart. And so I want to just rewrite the proofs that I kind of hinted at you in the following way. Imagine that you could prove in some sense that you know that in a time scale exponential gamma n, say when gamma is whatever, you, are, you know a priori that you will be at a certain energy level, so that you are sampling with respect to a certain microcanonical ensemble. So that you know a priori that, in fact, by equivalence of ensemble, if you, I don't know how you will prove that directly, but it's as if you were sampling those things under a Gibbs measure at an effective temperature. And I told you what the effective temperature was yesterday. It was beta divided by square root of rho. All right, now imagine that you have the Parisi formula, I mean, you have the Parisi formula and you understand it. For the moment, we don't even understand it for p-speed model, right? We don't, we, we have the formula, we understand, but we don't understand what the minimizer should be. Let's imagine that the Gardner's pictures has been proven, but, so, but this could be done abstractly. So at this effective temperature, you have the Parisi formula. The Parisi formula tells you that the Gibbs measure, you know, and, and everything we explained from this Penchenko picture, Dov Bish Sudakov, and all that, that this is essentially give, has the same overlap structure, random overlap structure, than an, a real probability cascade. Now, you know, I'm putting all my class together in this common. 
All right, so at certain temperature, you have a certain real probability cascade, a certain functional order parameter zeta. Great, so then maybe, so what, what I've been doing here is that this cascade was trivial. It was a cascade with one level. We had one Poisson Dirichlet process. And this is what is running the show here. But now imagine that you know that this cascade may have two levels, because you have one replica symmetry working, or 17 levels, which will not happen with mixed P spin, but let's, or, or even you know, an infinite number of levels. So you have this information. Then you could consider dynamics directly on the, on the probability cascade. It's perfectly natural and not too hard to define dynamics on real probability cascade, real cascades, and look at their behavior. And so by just knowing now that the, that the way you sample your points through the trajectory is related to the way you sample your points through a Gibbs measure at an effective temperature, and this, the overlap between those points, the structure is given by the same thing as a, as a real cascade, it's natural to conjecture that once what you, the, the kind of structure you obtain for the dynamics of the real cascade will be transferable to what you have for your P-spin model. But, which means there is, an, there is a, a limit model somewhere, which is the dynamics on the real cascades. And what we've been doing here is we had a discrete model, which was the REM, that converged to that. So we first proved that the, the REM is a, really converged well to that. And then we proved that the hard model are like the discrete model. So what I'm saying here, we should probably not do that. We should probably directly now for harder things, because for harder things, you should look at dynamics of the Grem, for instance. And these are notoriously difficult and painful, and maybe too painful. Because remember, in the static case, proving that the Grem was really converging to the cascade is the work by, by Bovier and Kurkova, which was supposed to be a picnic in the park. I can, I can tell you it's not. So uh, probably for the dynamics, it's the same thing. We should avoid doing the bouvier kurkova type of thing, directly introduce the dynamics on the limiting object, and proving the convergence to, the, to this thing without proving that the object is close to a gram, because that, that might not even be true. And so proving directly this is by using, how would we do that? Because there is no way to link this thing to a pro, uh, dynamics on, on, a, on a real cascade, is by doing the reasoning I just said. If you know one that in a certain time scale you're sampling a microcanonical ensemble, a certain depth, two that, this, that you have some uh, equivalence of ensemble, that is this is like sampling under a Gibbs measure on an effective temperature, then apply what you know for the, uh, from the Parisi picture, that there is the, the structure of overlaps is really the same as on a probability cascade, then you, on a real cascade, then you have a chance, right? This is what I believe is, uh, because if you look at the structure of this proof, in fact, that's what we fundamentally do. The only thing that is really important is the structure of the overlaps of the deep traps you find along your trajectory. And what we essentially say that this overlap is zero at least when you do some kind of aggregation and blocking. Right. So now what you would find is that these overlaps should not be zero. They may, ha may have, for instance, two values. And so this is what the, uh, what the uh, Ruel cascade should give. So I think the next order of things should be to directly study the dynamics on the Ruel cascade and then avoid going through the gram. So this last comment is really for professionals here. I'm sorry for the if this seems like too hypothetical, but I do believe that this is something that is, that is a way for, the, for, for going further. It would have the advantage of, if we could do something abstract like this, that we could have a result that would be conditional. We don't have to prove yet what's happening for the statics. We say, if there is one step replica symmetry breaking in the, at this level of temperature, then this is what happens for the dynamics. And then at some point, somebody will prove that there is a one replica symmetry breaking or, or more. Okay. And, and so that's, uh, that's how I see this. Uh. The interesting part is the following is, you know, I'm saying here what the regime we see in those sub -exp exponential time scale is far from equilibrium. But so when I say that, it's not equilibrium. It has nothing to do with equilibrium. But when I say that, I, 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 I cheat. 
In fact, what we see is equilibrium, but at a different temperature. That's, that's what we use, really. It's like equilibrium on this cube 2 to the rho n, at this effective temperature beta divided by square root of rho. And so that's what we're really using there. And, and uh, so, so if we say the same thing, when the equilibrium is more complex than, than the rem, then, then maybe we have a chance. Maybe we have a fighting chance. OK, so it's unusual that somebody gives a class and says something as, in particular, re recorded. Because some of my friends could not say, you're crazy. In particular, in a few years, if I'm completely wrong. But, but I do believe that, uh, there, that there was a chance to do something there. <laughs>